Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Dan, your friendly fishmonger at dansfish.com. Thanks for coming out to this little uh, nerd out, geek out session on aquarium fish. We do this every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 9 Eastern for those that might be mountain challenged. Thanks for coming by and spending a little bit of your Wednesday evening with us. There's already 109 folks here. That's not so bad for 7 o'clock on a Wednesday. Um, we have our shipping report that we'll tell you about. We have, as well, a giveaway. And then I have some exciting stuff to tell you, new stuff that we got in. And after that, we'll get to your questions and comments. So that is the uh, docket for the day. 11 a.m. in Australia. Elser, good morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shipping report. There's been no change. Last time I reported, we were at 98.85% success, and today we are still at 98.85 success. So we did not move the needle up or down. The good news is I was looking at um, this week's shipping and any losses. There were very, very few, and there were no catastrophes. So maybe one loss here, and then on another order another loss but there was no pattern there was no catastrophe so that that tells me that's just statistics at work right that's just uh the uh the luck of the draw on those so i don't think we made any big mistakes there was one bag that leaked um so i have to look into that and besides that i don't know if there was anything specific like that that we could point to ourselves for I think it was just kind of luck of the jaw of the draw so I feel good about that I wish we had improved I wish our percentage our mission is to get to 99% we're at 98.85 we're so close <laughs> five hundredths of a percent away um, from it so I wish that we had got there but at least at least there didn't appear to be any like big fault in our processes or procedures or anything like that not not from what I can tell or that I can remember. So that's good. That's good to know. Okay. So that's the shipping report. Weather is changing. It's funny. Uh, when it's really cold, we send a lot of big heat packs. And then you know it's springtime when you're, spending, when you're sending out more 20-hour heat packs than you are 40 and 60-hour heat packs. Because, uh, like, oh, there's one place... I think it was like 98 degrees one spot in Texas. It's like, woo, that's warm. That's, that's super hot. <laughs> so it's warming up out there. Happy spring, everyone. It's coming. I mean, not here. It snowed today here in Wyoming, but across most of the nation, it looks like it's coming. Northeast looked like you guys were really cold from all the packages we sent to New York and that area. And uh, also the, the Northwest looked really cold as well, but you guys in like Missouri and kind of that midsection in the United States, south mid, I guess. Looks like you guys are having some really nice weather. All right. Garen Bartell says, all my fish that came in last week came in amazing. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Garen. That's usually how it goes. So that's, that's usually what we expect. Although there is that, you know, um, 1.14. Five percent that has a problem, but I'm glad that you were not part of that. That that you didn't get caught in that bell curve. You know, the end of the bell curve where there's problems. I'm glad that statistics treated you right. We do everything we can. Um, okay, so let's get to the giveaway, and then I've got a little show and tell, and then we'll get to your questions and comments and just geek out on fish. A couple of announcements first, though. Um, I'll be speaking um, at the American Cichlid Association. Um, and that'll be, uh, that's in July. And then earlier in July, I'll be speaking um, in Georgia. Is it the Atlanta Aquarium Club? I can't remember the exact name of the club. Um, if, if, Mitchell Brooms here, he can tell us. He's a member of that club. So if you're in Georgia, I'll be there in July. I think it's July 20th, talking with you folks. And then uh, a week later, I'll be at the ACA talking there. 
Also, we are opening up Dan's Fish, the warehouse here for the July 4th weekend. So that'll be the 5th and 6th of July. If you want to come up to Sheridan, Wyoming, see, see some beautiful country and hang out and with other fish nerds and just spend time looking at a whole bunch of fish that we've got, that is the 5th and 6th of July. We'll feed you, we'll barbecue for you. And uh, all you have to do is get here. And then you can hang out and get fed. So that's, that's the, it's, it's a very informal thing, but that is something that's coming up as well. So July is going to be a very busy month for me. Atlanta Aquarium, Atlanta Area Aquarium Association. Thank you, Mitchell. That's the name of it. Atlanta Area Aquarium Association over there in Georgia. So a couple things coming down. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the giveaway. So we are giving away a highly underrated anabantoid. This is uh, Macropotus specti, the black paradise fish. And I think they're absolutely amazing. Now here's my picture. Not amazing, right? We've got a juvenile here. I have been unable to catch a mature male in all his glory, flaring out his tail and being, being gorgeous. So, but I think it is a very, very pretty fish. I've seen them, you know, as juveniles, and I've also seen them as adults. Here's kind of the wild type adult. I like the variegated kind of sail pattern on the tail. I just think they're really neat, underrated, and somewhat hard to find uh, brand, <laughs> brand, <laughs> species, <laughs> nature's brand, I suppose, <laughs> of paradise fish. So if you would like to uh, win a group of these guys, enter hashtag paradise, that's hashtag P-A-R-A-D-I-S-E in the chat, and you'll automatically be entered to win. Now a little bit about their care. Uh, very simple, very hardy. This is a tropical species. This is not like the standard paradise fish in the hobby that comes from up in you know Korea, where it gets pretty darn cold. These guys are down in Southeast Asia. I believe Vietnam, I'd have to check that, but a much warmer climate. So I wouldn't keep them in cold temperatures, but um, besides that, I think it's pretty much the same care as you would give a standard paradise fish, except for the aggression level. I think these guys are less aggressive than your standard paradise fish. So there is still going to be a hierarchy and all that, but a group of them together, I think will get along better than your standard paradise. Now there's still some aggression and bickering and all that, but in, from what I've seen and what I've observed, uh, it's less intense. So that's that. The black paradise fish, if you would like to win those, just enter hashtag paradise in chat and you'll be entered to win. Okay, there are 233 people here and we're about to get going. So if you know someone who you think would enjoy this kind of content, if you wouldn't mind sharing it out to them, we're trying to grow the channel. We finally did get over 30,000 subscribers, which is awesome for me. <laughs> for the, I mean, for the amount, there's some people that really pursue YouTube, right? They do a, several videos a week. They're looking at the algorithm and trying to figure out, okay, if I release on Friday morning at this time, I'll get this percentage better viewership than if I do it at, you know, Wednesday at 10 p.m. They get all into that. I ain't got time to do that. I would love to do that, honestly, because I'd love to focus on this channel and build it up and just have fun with it. But I don't have time. I'm taking care of a warehouse full of fish and trying to make sure that we always keep our quality up so that we can fulfill our mission of improving the aquarium fish industry. And so one day I hope to get there, but right now we're still scaling up. Um, we are, I think we're, I think we're out of kind of the startup stage, meaning if we didn't grow any more, <clears throat> we would still survive. It wouldn't be pretty, but we'd probably survive-ish. So we're, we're just coming out of that. That's how I define a startup. If you, a startup to me is a business that if it, 
if it doesn't continue to grow, is it still sustainable? And we're, we're coming right out of that phase, on the other end of that phase. So kind of just on the cusp of leaving the startup phase, I would say. Um, and so there's just a, a ton of work still as we scale and as we grow and we're growing rapidly. And the main thing is this, the, the main challenge I have is our growth rate rates kind of incredible. How do I manage that and make sure it's done in a way that our quality isn't compromised? That is what I'm laser focused on. So a couple of things we've done towards that end are um, hire a fish health officer. All this person does all day is diagnose fish medicate fish, make sure that the new imports are in good shape, make sure that the fish are in good shape before we sell them to you, uh, things like that. So we have a full-time employee. All they do is work at a fish lab here that we've built here in the warehouse and check the fish and treat them and make sure they're healthy before they go out. So that's the kind of thing we're putting in place to try to make sure that as we grow, we don't compromise on quality because that would be very easy to do. In fact, unfortunately, I think that's what happens to most companies. Not just, I'm not talking just in fish in general, but we all know companies that we love and then they grow and I don't know, maybe there's a merger or something. I don't know what it is, but as they scale, as they get big, they stop becoming the company we knew and loved. The quality changes, the product changes. So we're working really hard to make that not happen. Um, what got me on that? I don't remember. I guess it's just on my mind a lot. A whole lot. Hey, we have a new member. That's exciting. Who is that? Uncle Smiley's Aquariums has joined the Fishmonger crew, which I think I might change the name of members to the Danios and Danioellas because it's just too good. So uh, maybe we'll do that. But for now, welcome to the Fishmonger crew, both you and Leona. Esteline, I hope I said that right. Thank you. Thank you for joining up. Okay, let's get into some show and tell here. Okay, here are some. There's more than I'm going to show you, but here's some of the stuff that we were able to get listed on the website today. New items or items that we were out of stock on and have restocked. The first one... It's Corydoras Equus. We don't have a whole lot more of these guys, but um, we, there's a whole bunch of Java moss in the tank that has these. And Johnny went through today and stirred up, I think, a 10 or a dozen more. So we do have a few more Corydoras Equus. These come from a breeder in Germany. They're aquarium bred and raised, and they're rock solid. In fact, anyone here in the chat, if you've bought these uh, aquarium bred and raised Corydoras Equus from us, um, could you let us know if they're still doing well, if they're doing good for you? It's an expensive fish, and I think it would help folks um, hear your honest feedback, good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, and help them make the decision on if they want to put down the kind of money it takes to get a group of Equus or not. But from my experience here, I think they're rock solid. Chili Rasboras. We, this is a target species for us. This is one that is beautiful and a perfect little nano fish and I think everyone wants and is very difficult to get healthy in the industry. And we've been doing a pretty good job with this fish for quite a long time, but we've leveled up uh, now that we have someone that's working full time to diagnose fish and work up fish, examine fish in the lab. Now we know all of these come in with parasites. I didn't think that was the case because they come from a black water habitat and so I thought they were coming from water that was pretty sterile it's very low pH and so I wasn't worried as much about internal parasites turns out though they have them um, we source them from I've tried everywhere and we have a good source for these but good as they are they still need some treatment before they're released to for our customers. So if you've got these from us in the past, um, odds are they did well for you because they usually did. But now we know how to make them even better. So the batches we're selling now are probably the best batches we've ever had. 
Let's see here. Nico Fish, my husband's name is Corey. <laughs> he doesn't like these fish because of that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Kelly Foreman, I bought Equus from you almost four years ago, and they're still doing great. Awesome. Rick's Fish, the eight Equus I got are doing great. Okay. So, just want to get, you know, on expensive fish like that, I think it helps to hear from customers um, how the fish are doing. And by the way, if you got some and they're not doing well, they're doing bad or whatever, feel free to leave that. That's fine. We want to be transparent here and give people the actual, uh, give them the real scoop. Corridor is con color, the slate Cory. Now, this has been a challenge for us. Behind the scenes, we have been working to try to figure out how to source these in a sustainable way that treats the fish well. We have finally found someone who is willing to send them to us and is willing to package them specifically for us. They package them in much lower densities than the industry standard. And for the first time, we're able to get groups of corridors con color that arrived in good shape. There are no um, aquarium bred sources that, there's a few people that breed them here and there, but there's no industry source that you can get them from where they're bred and raised in aquariums. The fish uh, at the industry level are all brought in, as far as I know, from the wild. And trying to work with the importers and exporters of quarries and plecos, et cetera, from the wild, specifically from South America, in a way that the fish are done well is, is, is proven to be a challenge. So we've tried lots of ways, we've tried lots of vendors. We're hopeful that we have finally come across a vendor where we can source these from, hopefully somewhat regularly, because they're an awesome fish. This is my picture, and it's not the best, but it gives you an idea of kind of the green iridescence on them and the, the yellow fins that they get, lemon yellow fins. Here it looks kind of more orange. I guess it can be orange under some light. Um, but this is a young fish. What it doesn't show you is how they become absolute tanks. Let's see here. Um, I'm not sure that there's a great picture that's not a bad picture of an adult, but the, the body shape to me is striking on these. They're, they're, not, they're like thicker, taller bodied, more like a tank, like a, I don't know, pro wrestler or something than your average quarry. So we have a limited number of them, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get more in in the future and that the supplier will continue to do a good job. Now, this is the first batch we've gotten, we've tried lots of, uh, anyway, I don't need to go into that again. Finally, we found someone that supplied them how we asked and they came in good shape. Um, but it's early days yet. We, you know, one shipment did well. We'll see if we can get other ones to do well too. This, we also have a group of albino pineapple hyphen sore tails, not the veil tail that's popping up there, but these guys, really beautiful fish. They've been, uh, we found worms in them, they've been treated, they should be clear and ready to go. Croaking gouramis, now this is one of the most difficult fish to get, not in good shape, they usually come in good shape, but healthy. <laughs> when, when we had a veterinarian in residence this last summer, we had some of these that came in healthy and then started to, a few weeks later to kind of act poorly. And she examined them and she was like, Okay, they've got everything. Like these guys come in with all kinds of parasites. They come in with bacterial issues. They come in with everything. You have to throw the kitchen sink at them. But if, if you, once you do that and they're clear of those things, then they're a rock solid fish. So they come in in good body weight, but then the, the stress of the import allows those you know, pathogens to take over after a few weeks of landing on our doorstep. But uh, we know how to treat them now. And so the group that we have uh, is in pretty darn good shape. Same with sparkling gouramis or pygmy gouramis, same story. Pseudomilga furcatus, 
One of my all-time favorite pseudomugils. Probably because it's the first one I, I successfully bred and raised in, in good numbers and had, had good success with. I call them the cheerleader because they have these yellow pom-poms that they're always waving around. Uh, their pectoral fins there. Green laser quarries, we only have a few left from the previous import. And uh, here's our pitcher. In this picture, they look more bluish, and under certain light, they do indeed look this kind of bluish color. In other light, they look more of a greenish color, but really pretty fish all around. And hard to find, too. A lot of carry tetras, oh, just one of my favorite kerosens. I'm going to pick up the pace here. It's 722. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Sharp tail gobies, one you don't see often, one that's very easy to keep. Um, they eat dry foods just fine. They are not mean. They have a big mouth, so they'll swallow small fish. But they're not mean. They're not going to harass other fish. And I don't see a good picture. This gives you an idea of how big their dorsals are. Their tails are also impressive. And they will, they will routinely raise their dorsal and spread their tail and do this wiggle dance, which I think is one of the coolest things in nature. It's, here you go. Aquarium glass here looks like they caught it. It's not showing exactly, but they're very, see this gaping mouth, big displayed gills, raised fins. They do this dance and it's just beautiful, I think. They are not full of color, but when they raise their fins and dance around, they're still stunning. Found Achilles. Um, we found what the issue with these is, um, and it's, it's worms, but it's an easy worm to treat. So they've all been treated. And when we opened these up to, to figure out why can't we keep them alive? Cause I've had a hard time for a long time. You'd be amazed at how big the worms are. The worms that were in these fish were bigger than the fish, just huge things but um they've been cleared out and they've been they've recovered they, they should be healthy now they should be parasite free for you i should mention they're small like around half an inch or so this is a uh, they get around an inch maybe a little bigger with the big extensions the males get on the tail uh, but the the only place we found that we can get them in good shape where they don't die for us they do have worms but we can treat those and if we treat them right away we can recover the batch. Um, the only breeder we found we can get them from in good enough shape to have success with them sells, the, sells them at a, a pretty small size, but they'll be healthy. Um, the golden dwarf barb, Penthia gellis, a little barb around an inch, maybe, maybe an inch and a quarter, and not aggressive. Really nice little community fish, not aggressive. One of my favorite fish ever, again, because I used to raise this as a teenager, this is one of the first Aplicylus species I ever kept, is Aplicylus dei. They're even prettier than the pitchers, although the pitchers are, are pretty nice. Here's a female. The females are pretty. They have these nice black bars halfway up the body on the back half of the body. Um, and the males are really pretty as well. So you can't go wrong with Aplicylus dei. We have some cardinal shrimp. This is our own colony that we've been breeding here for I want to say a year now. Um, the colony was dwindling in numbers. We, we sold quite a few of them, but um, we split the colony a few months ago and now it's back up to the numbers where we can start selling them again. So we don't have a ton of these available because we don't want to oversell our colony, but we do have some nice ones and we're probably on our like, I don't know, 12th generation of these. It's a breeding project we've kept going. Marbled hatchet fish. Cherry shrimp, same thing. We oversold these for a while, but our colony is now back up and running. A Melanotini goldii, but not your average one. This is the one from Mayon River. And uh, as far as I know, we're the only place in the United States where you can get this location. I could be wrong, but as far as I know, that's true. Uh, most of us know Melanotini goldii decai, which is a different location. This is the Mayon River near Tamika. Neohetrandria elegans, the tiger teddy. Tiny little fish, full of personality, and gets this nice kind of orange spot in the middle of the body. 
Boris Maculatus, spotted Rasbora. Another species of Soloace shrimp. This is uh, Caridina loe, the, the mini blue bee shrimp, I believe is what it's called. I don't know why they call it that because it's more red than blue. I guess that one looks kind of blue. But most of the ones I see look more like, uh, more like this. Anyway, if you like the wild type Soloace shrimps, this might be one. This again is another colony bred and raised here for over a year now, so we're several generations into this strain. Blue Cochu tetras. Photolopantex emiedi. You know I'm a geek about killifish, so I've been bringing these in. We have a good breeder, they do a great job. Manakapura redback angelfish. We were able to list some more of these. Saffron orange sailfin mollies. I think we have the best ones of these I've ever seen. Um, usually if you, well, let me just show you. If you, well, I'll never be able to find it again. Okay, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> this might have been a mistake. If you look at most saffron mollies, they're kind of like this. Um, the, the saturation of the color isn't fully saturated. It's got white and that kind of saffron orange on it. Um, it might have a sail fin, but it's not anything super impressive as mollies go. Our strain is this. This is a picture I took of one of our breeder males. Huge dorsals. Big fish, they get pretty big body size, three, four inches, and saffron all throughout. So I think, I think we've got the best strain of these I've ever seen. Well, we do have the best strain I've ever seen. We also have just gold sailfin mollies. Um, I like these guys. They're not rare or anything, but they are healthy. I guess that's rare. If we look at these quadrupunctatas, this one is rare. This is the four-spot Mary Widow, and it's not an extremely showy fish, but it is a very difficult fish to get. And I don't know why, because they breed like rabbits and they're hardy. So I'm not sure why they're so difficult to find, but neat wild type live bear. If you want a live bear that's small, easy to breed, and sells at a decent price because it's hard to find, you could do worse than the four spot Mary Widow. Rummy nose rasboras, Sabwa resplendens, Really beautiful fish, and these naturally come from hard alkaline water. These are not a black water species. So for folks that want to match fish with natural pHs, this one's easy to do in, uh, in your tap water, in most of the United States. We were able to get some more of the blue diamond uh, angelfish. This is a picture I took from a previous batch. I need to update the picture because this is a small one that's more juvenile and has still really strong striping. The ones we have in right now look a lot more like this. Um, they have very obvious diamond scaling and um, more, more blue with less obvious striping. Well, it's a mix. I guess they're on the cusp. Some have the strong striping and some are starting to lose it. Tank's right over there, so I can, I can see them. Cooley loaches. Enough said. We're almost done, folks. <laughs> Threadfin rainbows, one of my all-time favorite fish. Just, this is a stunning fish. And they actually do look this good, better, I would say, when they display. And when they're healthy, they display regularly. This isn't like something they do once every, you know, twice a year during the rainy season or something like that. They're displaying all the time. You get these amazing fins and what you don't see in the pictures is how they flutter them. They flutter them super rapidly like a hummingbird, and then they hold them erect as they kind of swim around and sway their body, and then they flick them really fast again. It's just one of the most stunning uh, sights in nature. A dream tank I have is to have a, a, a big aquarium, say like 125 gallon or 200 gallon aquarium, with a massive school of these in it. That will take up pretty much the central area. A whole bunch of some kind of dwarf quarry on the bottom. And then a whole bunch of 
I don't know if it would be platinum uh, half beaks or marble pencils or pygmy hatchets or something like that, or marble hatchets or pygmy hatchets, but something up at the top. But a big school of these, they're a small fish, but a bunch of them in a big tank I think would look amazing. Um, some peacock gudgeons, rainbow shiners, just about the prettiest fish in North America, especially when they do this. This is them in spawning colors. They turn bright pink, like neon blow your mind pink. I've bred them a few times and uh, I've seen this for myself and it's not an exaggeration. They are, they're crazy when they transform like that. But even when they aren't transformed, the males still get a nice bluish um, spangling on them. Now, they have to mature to do that, and it's going to take a few months. Uh, people often buy this fish and be like, it's not the color. And I'll just be, I know, just be patient. And they'll two weeks later email me and be like, it's not the color. I know, be patient. A few more months later, they're like, hey, they did it. Now they're that color. So they do take time. It's a fish you have to be patient with. Emperor gudgeons, or I'm sorry, empire gudgeons. I don't know why I put them emperor. They're empire gudgeons. The, the empire gudgeons that we have are the smallest ones I've ever received. They're right around an inch. So these are not big colored fish. I can't sex them. Um, I've never seen them come in this small before. They're healthy. They're great. They'll grow. Um, but just be warned, they're small. And then some Congo Tetras, a really nice group of Congo Tetras. So that, that's the show and tell for the day. Next week, I'll have more interesting show and tell for you. Um, I've got some fish I'm very excited about that I'll be able to tell you about next week. But for now, that's where we're at. Holy cow, while I was talking, Kelly Foreman gifted 10 Dance Fish memberships. Kelly, thank you so much. That is amazing. And Jim, Jim Cummings became a member of the Fishmonger crew as well. Or Jim, I'm sorry. Jeff, how dare I? <laughs> sorry, Jeff. Jeff Cummings joined up and became a member of the channel. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate that. All right, let's shift gears, get to your questions and comments, and kill an hour of this evening, shall we? Before we do that, I want to thank my moderators for being here. Hello, Chevy Fish. I see you. And uh, for doing what they do, moderating the chat, making sure Killers, Reptiles, and Aquatics is here, making sure that things go smoothly in the chat. I really appreciate you folks volunteering your time and doing that. Hello, why are we always yelling? Thanks for monitoring. Appreciate the mods. Okay, with that, I'm going to scroll up and see what questions and comments are directed to me. What I'm looking for, for the noobs, if you're new here, what I'm looking for as I scroll are these bright orange boxes that say at Dance Fish or Dance Fish or hashtag Dance Fish. But if, if I see this bright orange box, then I know it's a comment directed to me and I'll stop and read that. If it's not bright orange, then I think it's just you guys chatting among yourselves having a good time. So I don't stop for those. Joseph Noel, Corridors Equus are amazing folks, so healthy, fat, and active. Uh, colors are amazing. I'm hoping to get my group of eight to breed. Oh, I hope you do too, Joseph. Please do. Jeff just bought six. Oh, that might do it. We might be out now. There might be a couple left. Not quite sure. Do you have a favorite pro wrestler? Oh, man. No. I've never... I. Have I ever in my life actually seen a pro wrestling match? I don't think I have. So I, I don't know that world at all. Matt West. Thank you for bringing in the con colors. Just placed my first order for some. All right. Great to hear it. Matt, I would be very interested in your feedback. Uh, again, this is a species we've had trouble with in the past. We're trying to figure out. So we think these are in good shape, but please let us know if they arrive in good shape. And then maybe a couple weeks after, are they still doing well? And then maybe a month after you got them, just let us, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind emailing us, hello at dancefish.com and letting us know. Um, we just want to track that so we can be sure that we are doing the right thing on our end to make sure that we're sourcing them correctly. 
Um, that's a fish I'd, I'd really like to crack the code on that fish. It's an awesome fish. Lots of people want it. It's hard to get. And, uh, man, it's, it needs help. The industry does not treat it well. Joseph, your green laser quarries are also doing fantastic. They're a bit shy again, but the Equus, beautiful quarries. Or like the Equus, but beautiful quarries. So funny, like, our green lasers are out and about not shy at all. And so are Equus. But then, the next batch I get, I might put in the tank next door to them. And they might be totally shy. It's, it's so interesting to me how... So when I was a professor, I would consider each class its own organism. It was very interesting how different each class would be. So let's say I'm teaching in a classroom. A class comes in. I teach... They leave, the new class comes in. Like, they can be completely different class uh, organisms, basically. Behave differently, need different care. I have to teach in a different way just because there's something about <laughs> those groups that even though they're in the same classroom, they're taking the same chorus, there's something about the, the constitution of each group, the individuals in it and how they mix together, that makes it so different. Fish are kind of like that. Um, I can have two groups of fish in two aquariums right next to each other. One will act one way, the other will act a totally different way. It, it always boggles my mind. It's probably like, I don't know, the flow is slightly different in one aquarium, so they act differently, or uh, some little detail is different, and it makes all the difference. Divide by zero. Hey, Dan, I got a question for you. I need a fry predator to take care of over-prolific fish. Was looking at your list, thinking of the red chin pan jacks for 10 gallons. Thoughts? Yes, absolutely. They're voracious fry eaters. They will take care of that problem for you. Um, yeah, I'd be very surprised if they didn't. That's their favorite thing to do. They like to eat insects, and they like to eat fish fry. <laughs> Um, Natalie B, do they need others of their kind? The black paradise fish, the Macropoda specti, don't. Um, you can keep a single one just fine. Brian Holdridge, the blue metal dragon guppy pair are beautiful and doing well. They are sharing a 20-gallon neocaridina tank with a school of chilies. Oh, I'm glad to hear that they're doing great for you. Thanks for letting me know, Brian. I hope you get lots and lots of babies. Yeah, those metal blue dragons really did, it is a very nice batch. I was very happy with them. Vincent says, okay, at Mitchell Broom, planning to come to Atlanta to see Dan's fish, but Dan has to promise not to bring any snow. <laughs> I'm in Wyoming, that's a promise I can't keep. I don't know what, what's going to come with me. <laughs> Charles Adokita I'll have to send Johnny some pics of my male saffron molly that I got from you guys. He looks pretty good. I think he still has some growing to do. Yeah, so when I first got... Okay, so I paid a lot for those saffron mollies. They're expensive. And when I got them, they looked like... Let's see if I can find a picture here. Saffron. Okay. So they all looked more or less like this fish in the foreground. They were a pretty color, but they weren't impressive in body shape or sail fin or anything like that. And what I thought they had done is send me all females, because most mollies I've had that came in at that size were sexable. And so I did not sell them because I was like, I can't charge people um, the cost I would have to for these. It doesn't make any sense. There's something like, I don't know, 70 bucks a pair or something like that. And I, I couldn't, I, I saw like maybe one male. I was like, I think I just got all females or something. So, but I didn't know for sure, so I sat on them. 
And it probably took three to four months. This was not a quick process. But they did start developing. The males started to really develop. And they transitioned into these beautiful fish with these massive dorsal fins. And they were, and they were big, three, four inches. So they had to get good size before they really started sexing out. And then once they sexed out, it took quite a while before they started developing their nice finnage and stuff. So this is a patience fish. And once I saw that, I ordered a bunch more because I was like, oh, now I get why they're special. But it took quite a while for that to manifest. BK, thank you so much for the super chat, BK. What's up, fish geek? Dan, another week down, and you're still the man. <laughs> yeah, I checked earlier today, and I think I'm still a man. Yep. I know, no guarantees on next week, but as of now, I can confirm. <laughs> I'm still a man. <laughs> okay. So, Charles, yeah, send us the pictures. Um, and if you bought the ones that are at the current price point, which is uh, 30 bucks. Those are the, those are smaller. Those have not yet grown uh, and developed their full finish. Ari Cat, do you all get female rummy nose raspberries? Yes, we do. Uh, often we can list them as pairs. I don't know what we have right now. Uh, rummy. I think the ones right that we have right now are unsexed. Um, would you, if that's what you want, would you email us hello at dancefish.com, H E L L O at dancefish.com, and just ask if we have both sexes? And if we do, they're pretty easy to tell the genders. Mike, what's the most common medicine you find your fish doc using on fish suppliers you thought were solid and clear? Should we generally dose proactively even on fish? we watch past quarantine. So, like, I shudder to think, okay. Oh, sorry, I don't know why I switched to that screen to, to read the comment. <laughs> so, it, yeah, I'll tell you that, Mike. I want to preface this, though. Like, I truly think that even before we hired this position and had the veterinarian in residence this summer, that we were top of the line on practices for fish health, for medicating and all that. Now that we have someone full-time to do nothing but diagnose and treat fish, we're learning so much. And I just shudder at the thought of how many fish I passed on unknowingly that did have parasites or some other issue. It's just, there was, we had no way of knowing that. So the fish come in, they look great. We observe them through quarantine. They're doing awesome. We sell them. Or oh, they're not, okay, we need to medicate them. Or we know that this type of fish often has this problem. So we'll prophylactically medicate and pass them on. Now that we're seeing the actual um, diversity of pathogens fish come in with, in how many of them come in with something, I just, I shudder to think of how many fish are out there that are struggling and need help. Um, it's been a real eye opener. I would say that Levamisol and Ickex probably take care of the majority of the issues we see. Um, ICX treats ick, but it also treats a lot of other external protozoans. And a um, lot of the fish come in with worms, roundworms specifically, and nematodes. And uh, levamisol is pretty effective on treating that. So if you're only to treat two things with, with two medications, those are the two that I would suggest from what I've seen lately. Now, I'm not a veterinarian. Um, I'm not a fish biologist. I'm none of those things. And my opinion might change. Like after a year, 
I might have more data and, and switch that opinion to something else. But we see a whole lot of roundworms and we see a whole lot of ick and other related protozoans. One interesting thing I've learned about ick is the majority of the cases of ick we find, the white spots are not manifesting on the fish. So we'll have a tank of fish that's doing great, and then after a week, we come in one day and there's a, a lot of them are down. We're like, what? What's going on? Uh, now we know what's going on because we were able to examine the fish earlier. But what we found is a lot of those fish, or there's no fish dead, but a bunch of them are gasping at the surface or just acting weird. Um, when we examine those, we find a ton of ick. So what we find happening is ick is building up in fish and killing fish. So it's getting to, to enough of a concentration, it's killing the fish. And we never see the white spots on the fish. I didn't know this. I always thought before that if I had ick, I would see white spots. Now I'm learning that it's actually most of the time, there are no white spots. They kill the fish before that happens. And I think the reason is, is because the fish is swimming through the water and it's breathing, right? It's pulling water in through its gills and filtering out the oxygen or absorbing the oxygen. And so as the little, are they tomites? The little swimmers, the little ick babies are swimming around looking for a host. Where do they get concentrated? In the gills, not on the skin, in the gills, because the fish is constantly breathing in water and sucking in water. So a high water volume is going through those gills. And so I think what happens is, again, not a biologist or veterinarian, but just what I think is that the uh, the ick is getting in the gills and it's concentrating there and it gets into high enough numbers that it kills the fish without getting infestation um, on the skin, on the uh, epithelium of the fish. So that really surprised me. I didn't know that I could have ick without seeing the classic white spots. But a lot of, I never knew this, but a lot of fish die of ick and they never demonstrate the symptoms we would normally look for for ick. Yeah, blew my mind. Okay, scrolling here. But other things that are, we commonly use, Mike, that are in our arsenal that we use a lot are flubendazole, metronidazole, praziquantel, um, and rafloxacin. Which, which treats gram-negative bacteria, and some gram-positive as well. And there's a host of others, but those are the ones that uh, we end up using most commonly. KCM Aquatics. Would you be interested in some native freshwater fish? We have the ability to catch rainbow darters, green darters, johnny darters, etc. Just looking to see if there's a market. Yes. KCM, if you would email me. Uh, hello at dancefish.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com. I would love to do that. I can't keep any native fish that is found natively in Wyoming. And there are a few darter species that are native to eastern Wyoming. Um, there's a few shiners as well. So I just have to make sure that it's not one that's illegal in my state or unlike any kind of federal endangered or threatened list or anything. But yeah, rainbow darters should be just fine. I would love that. Katol, any amajarensis on the docket? Um, are you talking about Melanotania majorensis? Are you talking about um, Melanotania bosmane from Lake Amaraju? If you're talking about Melanotania amajarensis, no. I love that fish. Let's, okay, let's look at this fish. Let's see here. I always spell it wrong. Ajumarensis? Ah. <laughs> okay, I'll find it. I'll find it. Where are we? Here it is. Okay. So this is Bonatania ajumarensis. Um, I think it's a really pretty fish. Looks a lot like a Bosmani, but 
colors up very nicely. Um, these are juveniles. The adults get really, really black and get a really dark front half as well. Just a really, really pretty fish. And they were in a tank right there, and I would see them all day long, and they would blow my mind when twice a day or so they would flare up and color up and display. The problem I have is it took me more than a year to sell the batch. So I probably got 20 of them, and I think it took over a year to sell them. So it makes no sense, Kate, for me to bring in another group of those <laughs> and sit on them for another year. Much as I like them personally, which I do, it, it would be bad for the business, so. Okay, Spinster Sister, I've been wearing my blue dance fish t-shirt the entire week. Yeah, there it is. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I've had three people stop me asking about it. One spot, stopped to, taught me, to tell me you ordered because of my shirt. Hey, Spinster, thank you. Thank you for being our walking billboard. We appreciate that. <laughs> Mama Duck, oops, you missed all my kudos regarding the fish I've got from you that you displayed tonight. They're doing super. I'm glad to hear that, Mama Duck. That's what we strive for. Um, oh, <laughs> okay. I don't know how to say this. I'm going with Spicobra Rote. Yeah. Since I didn't see the answer, but I assume only U.S. and Canada can join the giveaway, correct? Right now, um, the giveaway can be done in the United States and Puerto Rico. We're not yet shipping to Canada. I think around May we'll be able to do that. I'm just waiting for it to warm up a little bit up there. Um, sometimes with Canada, customs gets confused. Okay, people sometimes work at the customs office or whatever that aren't used to live fish coming in. Let's, uh, is what I imagine happens. And even though we follow all their rules, um, sometimes people that don't know what's going on get confused and the, the fish get delayed a day at customs. And when that happens in the bitter cold Canadian winter, it's a problem. So we've decided this winter to not ship until it warms up again. And then we'll... And it's hard to work, like we've, we've tried to like work with the Canadian officials and figure it out and there's just nothing more for us to do. Like we're literally following their processes and procedures. Um, so there's nothing we can do to make sure they don't get delayed. So because of that, we stop shipping in the cold weather and we'll ship again when it warms up. And we hope that uh, by next winter, maybe things will be different. Maybe they'll be a smoother process or something to where we can continue to ship throughout the winter. But things were getting delayed pretty regularly, so we, we held up. So right now, it's not warm enough to ship to Canada, so we can't... Uh, this giveaway is not open to Canada right now. Fred Fisher, can you recommend any books for beginners or advanced? No, but I can recommend a bookstore. I'll put the link down below. This is seahorses.com, which is the website for the aquatic bookshop. Um, Jim Forche, a very, very dear friend of mine, has been running the aquatic bookshop since the 80s. He knows everything about fish books and periodicals, etc. cetera. So, um, Fred, I would, uh, I would drop a line to Jim there at his website. Uh, you can find his email address there at, at uh, seahorses.com. And tell me, hey, I'm a beginner. What do you recommend? Um, I... The, the, the issue with with books specifically is that the information changes so rapidly that a book that was put out a few years ago is probably extremely out of date because the equipment that the aquarium industry um, is churning out has changed and the, lots of things change pretty quickly. So sure, there's a lot of great books out there, but for someone that's a, a beginner, um,
trying to think of like a current up-to-date book specifically for beginners. And I'm drawing a blank. So I, I would reach out to Jim. What I would suggest is there are some very good uh, YouTube channels out there with good information for beginners. I think Mark's Aquatics does a great job. I think Aquarium Co-op does a great job. Um, Primetime Aquatics, Jason over there does a great job. And, and there's others as well. I, now I've said a few without the intention of saying everyone, and hopefully I don't offend anyone that I didn't say the name of their channel. Um, but, but the issue with YouTube is there's a lot of information out there that's contradictory and stuff, and it's hard to sort sometimes. And sometimes there's plain bad information. In books as well, though. So, I don't know. I feel, I feel Fred, that I'm letting you down. But there's no, nothing that comes to mind that's up-to-date and specifically helpful to beginners. Well, one, one book that I think is extremely valuable is Mike Helwig's book on culturing live foods. It's out of print now, so it's expensive. And it's not specifically about how to set up a tank and care for it. But one thing that I think really helps people get to the next level of fish keeping, especially if you want to breed fish and raise baby fish, but even just optimal fish health and condition is raising live foods. Not necessary, but does take things to the next level. So I think that book is valuable for anyone who is uh, keeping aquarium fish, whether they're a beginner or a seasoned expert. Natalie B gifted five dance fish memberships. Natalie's making it rain. Natalie, thank you so much. That's very generous of you and it helps the channel quite a bit. So thank you. Bardsdale Goldens. Nice to hear from you, Bardsdale. Any chance you will get some more, some Tucano Tetras? I want to get more, but I've been looking, have, oh, geez. Whew. Let's read, shall we? <laughs> Words are hard. I want to get more, but having trouble finding them. Also, ever had a snakeskin barb? Saw a pic and they look amazing. So first, I'll talk about the snakeskin barbs. They are amazing. They're peaceful. They don't get too large. They're great. Go for it. Wonderful barb. I haven't brought them in for quite a while, though. For the same reason, I'm not going to bring in any more... Um, um, Ajumarensis anytime soon, which is, I brought them in, I thought they were amazing, but they took forever to sell. Same with like snake, uh, snakeskin barbs, same with like pentazon barbs. Um, there's lots of fish that I would love to bring in, but the market wouldn't support it. So that's not one I plan to bring in again anytime soon, just because I'll bring them in and I'll sit on them forever. The Tucano Tetra I would like to bring in. I do have sources for them. The problem is that um, to get them from a good source I trust, they're very expensive. And I don't think the market would bear the price that I would have to sell them at in order to get them from the type of supplier I want to do business with. So I would be, I, I'm okay being more expensive than other places to do it right but there comes a tipping point where the price is so high that people just aren't going to buy them even though it's like i had to do that because in order to source them responsibly humanely um and this fish lands in that category i forget what price it would be i'd have to sell them out but it's it's really high and it's so much higher than the competitors that I just don't think the market would support it. So I've chosen not to bring that Tetra in because I don't think it would work for the business. Jerry Serple Morse. Hey, Dan, might be up in Sheridan for work again in a few weeks. If I'm able to get up there, is there any way to pick up fish and fly them back? Or would I have to jump through the hoops getting them on the plane? Well, first of all, Jerry, um, please come say hi. We'd love to see you. I have not brought fish in a plane on, on an a airplane in forever. So I honestly don't know. Um, excuse me. <laughs> it's been a week. Um, I know folks do it. I know some folks that do it regularly. 
And I know there's several YouTube videos out there for folks that did it, but be aware that there's no guarantee at any time, I, I believe it's the captain, it's up to the discretion of the airline and the captain, and I don't know if TSA, but the captain specifically can at any time say, no, I don't want those on my plane. So I think that's the risk you run is you bring them up there and it might be a very small percentage of the time, but there is a chance that the airline could say, ah, no, we want, we don't want those on the plane. And then what do you do? So that's, that's what I worry about. But again, I haven't done it in like forever. I uh, wish I could say, yeah, it's easy. Just throw them in a suitcase and take them. But I don't know that. KCM Aquatics. We finally set up a YouTube channel trying to have a channel on each platform. Wish us luck. On each platform? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I know what you're saying, though. You're probably saying the major platforms. There's literally hundreds, if not thousands, of platforms out there. So <laughs> that's why I'm chuckling. But I imagine you're saying, like, YouTube, um, I don't know, Instagram, TikTok, you know, the big ones. Professor Fish Tanks. In case you didn't see the original question, I didn't. Any chance of getting in freshwater pipefish again? Yes, I can. Uh, that's another one that doesn't make a lot of business sense. Um, and for, this time it's not because they wouldn't sell. It's because it takes so long to get them healthy and fat and sassy and stuff before we can sell them that I think last time it took me four months. I brought in some pipe fish and it took me four months to get them healthy and to sell them. Now they bred for me and stuff. It was super fun. It was like for me, the hobbyist inside of me loved it. It was great fun watching them breed and all that. But from the business standpoint, Taking three to four months to get a fish that's th at that price point healthy doesn't make a lot of sense. I'm not saying I won't do it again. Um, I, I might try it again. In fact, I do plan to try it again, but, but that's the difficulty. I can't try it again, though, until we hire another position. So here's what's happened. The, um, there is so much work to do in just diagnosing fish that uh, that position doesn't have time to feed the fish and care for the fish and do those other things. So that's all falling on my shoulders on top of everything else I have to do. So we've decided that um, originally that person was going to make sure the fish were fed properly because um, that's part of fish care and do the work and do the diagnostics. Um, there's just too many diagnostics. In order to, to do the diagnostics properly, you have to spend some real time. And there's, we get so many fish in so often that there's no way for that person to keep up with that and do the other part. So, um, in a little while, as, as we have less issues with fish because we're diagnosing and treating them, then we'll have less fish loss and we'll save some money because of that. Not, not to mention fish lies, which is the main thing, but just uh, from the business side, we'll save money when that happens. And so once the amount of money we save equals the amount of money we need to hire a new person, then we'll hire someone whose job it is just to feed the fish, care for the fish, not do diagnostics, just do fish care, husbandry um and maintenance and uh when that happens maybe you'll have the time to bring in a specialized species like dwarf pipe fish and play with them but right now bringing in a species that's fairly specialized uh doesn't make sense because of how thin we're all spread so those are the two challenges with that species fluffy cow i hope you're doing well my man Looking for stocking ideas for a 29 gallon coffee table tank. I like threadfin rainbow fish. They're gorgeous. They're active. They flutter like little butterfly hummingbirds. 
and they're not too expensive and we have some very nice healthy ones right now so if I had a 29 gallon on the coffee table I would get a group of those and if it's a well-established mature tank I would probably do a dozen of them is what I would do in that tank Kyler Nunes, are you expecting? No, but thanks for noticing. <laughs> are you expecting to get more electric blue Pistogramma? Uh, do you mean electric blue Rams? If you do, then yes. Yes. We, we hope to have some of those available soon. Ceiling Goblin. What a username. <laughs> My Royal White Cloud Mountain Minnows came in yesterday and are doing fine. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. It's a neat little fish that... Royal or Vietnamese white cloud mountain minnow. Yeah. You have good taste. They're active. They're pretty. They're small. They're peaceful. It's a good little fish. First class. Oh, I have to say this with an upper class accent. A first class fish. Can you do an article on treating fish disease? Running the gamut from standard quarantine to specific to fish specific, what's common and what fish, etc. This would be a gift to the health of the fish. I need to get more data before I do something like that. But yeah, I'll definitely be doing some stuff like that. In fact, for the folks that come to the barbecue, uh, 4th of July weekend here at the Dance Fish Warehouse, um, one of the things I plan on doing is, I don't know if you call it a workshop, it's an informal presentation, I don't know. We'll, we'll gather around a computer screen and I'll show you the stuff of nightmares. I'll show, I'll show you the stuff we find and I'll talk about how we treat it. Um, but before we do anything, you know, publish papers or, or anything like that, we need more data. But yes, uh, that's something that's been tickling in the back of my mind. What I think would be really cool is uh, if we could do a presentation at the next, uh, oh, what is it, Aquatic Veterinary Medicine Conference, um, where we can run things down and say, hey, we examined this many fish, and this percentage had this, and this percentage had this, and this percentage had this. And so, you know, based on that, it seems like if we prophylactically use these three medicines, uh, we would take care of, you know, 60-70% of the issues that our fish have. So things like that, I think, could be useful uh, so that store owners or folks that don't have a lab, maybe can still make most of their fish better in a simple way, easily, in a cost-effective, easy way. So that's the kind of stuff we're thinking about, but we're not ready to do it yet, first-class fish. And, and there's no guarantee I will do it. Um, you know, I... There's a place for amateur science, but I don't know at what point you cross into, uh, I don't know, liability, misinformation, I'm not sure. Um, I've done videos on how we quarantine and all that. Of course, that's all changed so much since I made those videos. But when I do those, I say, here's how we do it here. And that kind of doesn't say, I'm not prescribing anything or, or anything like that. I'm just saying, hey, if this was my fish, this is what I would do. So, I don't know, maybe there's a way to do it. Matt West, we'll provide feedback on the con colors. I would appreciate that, Matt. They are going in a great quarantine tank, and I already have another existing group of con colors. They will join when they get out. Good to hear it. All right, let's see how we're doing here. It's 810. There's 385 people here and 17 new members. That is awesome. Thanks everyone for being here and thanks to everyone that joined up or gifted memberships. That's great progress. Jose Rodriguez, have you ever considered selling or stocking Sudamugo? Yeah, we've got several types of Sudamugos right here. So, okay, so let's go to the website. I think the U comes before the E, yeah. Oh, no. Okay, so we've got Fricatus. Oh, is that the only kind we have available right now? Okay, I see why you're asking. Um, we will have RO2 available soon. 
We will have Gar uh, Luminatus available soon. And I do try to get some of the more interesting, rarer types as well. I don't have... Let's see here. I don't have... Ivan Safai in right now? I don't think so. Yeah, so I have Furcata and RU2s will be available soon as well as Luminatus. Um, and I'm, I'm always working to get the other ones as well. Garen Bartella. Just got sparkling grommies from you. I know they are in sex, but uh, how do you tell the difference? I'd, I'd have to go look at the tank to refresh myself. I would imagine... Oh, I know there's a way to do this. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Anyone here that know that? Does anyone here know that and can chime in in the chat and answer Garen's question? Because off the top of my head, I don't remember. Scotty the Fish Freak! Any different killies in the works in quarantine or on the order list? Rakovii? Um, can I just tell you tune in next week, Scotty? Um, I'll just say that. Tune in next week. Yeah. Brian Simpson, what changed with the Congo Tetras? New supplier finally? Oh, no. Congo Tetras uh, are bred and raised by the bajillions in the industry. So, um, Phenacogrammus interruptus, the Congo Tetra, is not one that I have to source wild from the Congo. So, that's one I can get from lots of different breeders. Very commonly bred. Um, a little bit of news, though, on the Congo is there's a glimmer of hope. Uh, there's a supplier that seems to be maybe worth putting an order in with. Um, I haven't had the time to dig in as much as I would need to to make that final decision. But there's a glimmer of hope there. I'm just... You know, <laughs> once bitten, twice shy. Natalie B, do neon gobies need to be in groups? Sorry to keep all these questions. No, that's what the chat's for. Ask the questions. That's great, Natalie. We're here to help. I welcome the questions. I welcome the participation in the chat. Um, they don't need to be in groups, no. But if they are in groups, you'll see a lot more neat behavior because they'll constantly be interacting with each other kind of, you know, flaring to show, hey, I'm the big boy here. I'm, I'm pretty, look at me, to the ladies. Um, they'll constantly be active amongst themselves, and you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of them, I think, than you would if you just had one. Now, by themselves, they're a cool little fish. They scoot around, they graze on stuff, they're personable. But when you have a group of them, and they're always flaring at each other and showing their best colors and displays uh, to keep their place in the hierarchy, you know, You'll just, I think you'll enjoy them more. Kate Hole, do you have any brand of bags you use to ship? No. We have to, uh, I mean, right now we're getting a lot of our bags from Uline. But every bag we get, we have to customize or fix. So there are no bags off the shelf that I'm aware of that you can buy and have, have ready to go. So... Yeah, we've had custom manufactured bags and 33% uh, of them leaked. And so we just were like, well, we can't have that. So we just automatically reseal and alter every bag we get. Um, yeah, I wish I could find a good manufacturer out there that would make the bag we need and actually do it in a way that they would hold water. <laughs> <laughs> like you would think that could be done easily but i think we've tried three different manufacturers and so far that has not been the case uline has been the best but they don't come with the corners crimped or anything like that so the fish can get their heads in the corner and get stuck in there and get pinched and die and so we have to uh we call it cornering all the bags that we get from them the custom made bags that we've sourced where they do 
uh, alter the shape of the bag so there's no corners for the fish to get pinched in um, have all leaked so we have to make our own Nathan is wondering about when Amazon puffers will be available I don't know um, we have a group right now that I've been working on for four or five months and I still haven't got to the bottom of what's going on with them. They just aren't gaining weight like they should. So still trying to figure that batch out. Emmy Med, do you think you'll ever get the Splash Tetras back in stock? I do. In fact, I ordered them and tried to get them in, um, but they were shorted. I think that was Monday. I expected to get some in, but they were shorted. So I was unable to get them in, but I'll try again. I do like Splash Tetras a lot. Boots and cats and boots and cats. Oh, in the chat and jumps. I was so excited to uh, answer boots and cats comment after, you know, after going into uh, nightclub mode. <laughs> but, but then it jumped. I can no longer see your question or comment there, boots and cats. Sorry about that. But hello. Welcome. Good to see you. Ben, my tequila split fins from Aquabid got delayed a day. Lows are in the 40s. Odds they survived the extra 24 hours longer than originally planned. Probably pretty good. Um, good days can take lower temperatures. Uh, hopefully they don't come in at 40 degrees. That might be a little cold for them, but maybe not. I, different good days can take it down pretty low. So of all the fish to get delayed, that's one of the better ones. Now I know nothing about how they pack and oxygen levels and if the water is clean or anything like that, but Temperature wise, if I was having a fish delayed, I'd rather it be a, a, a good day or split fin um, than most other species that I sell. Guppy Fever, Mike, have you hired all your open job positions? Yes, all of our job positions are now hired. It's just we need, uh, we need to hire more. But we, so the way we do things here is we try to be very frugal and we try not to spend our way out of problems. What we try to do when we encounter a, a pain point is find a way to change our processes or procedures or efficiencies or whatever it is um, to fix the pain point that way. And when we get to the point where we can know where we, it's obvious we can't do that, then we'll spend money um, on new equipment or a new hire or whatever. The reason we do that is because, first of all, companies that just spend their way out of problems tend to get be run very inefficiently and uh, become, uh, I don't know, bloated? Is that, is that a, I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I have nothing against giving people jobs. But uh, people aren't going to have their jobs for long if you're in a competitive, competitive marketplace and you're not running your business as efficiently as you can. So um, we want to have to think through the problems carefully before we throw money at them. Because then as we grow and scale and stuff, we'll end up with a better company in the long run than we would if we just spent our way out of problems. So um, that's kind of our philosophy here. So for example, right now, we know we want that position, but we're not ready to hire for it yet. What we need to determine is how much will our fish health officer position be able to, how much of a difference will that position be able to make? Um, how many fish will they be able to save? How much of a percentage of, of fish deaths or unhealthy fish will shrink? And how much does that result in a dollar savings for the company? Based on that knowledge, we'll know, okay, by having this position, as we scale to this level or whatever, um, we will free up this much cash. And so we can expect to be able to afford to hire this many people. We can say, what's the demands that we need? Oh, okay, we can hire them. Or, ooh, we, gotta, we can hire this many, but we're, we still have a problem here. We got to figure out the efficiencies there. So um, 
what we want to do is have that position get up and running and expert enough that without increasing our sales, without doing anything else, um, that we could hire the caretaker position. So that's the goal of how to, so, so that the, so that the company, um, every position, the company earns every position, every new position that's open for hire, if that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that well, but <laughs> that's, that's the way my brain can explain it on a Wednesday night after a kind of horrendous week. Um, boots and cats, boots and cats. Did you ever euthanize, do you ever euthanize fish like for biopsies? Is there a med you use or does it have to be done by a vet? So, yes, we do that on, on every, every time we work up a fish. Um, and we use, sometimes we can use um, actual anesthetics, um, medical grade anesthetics and things like that. But also we often just use clove oil. And if you know how to use the clove oil, it works very well and it does not, you know, put the fish in a state of distress or anything like that. So um, I would say for a hobbyist, the easiest way to do it is clove oil. And the way I would recommend doing it is to have a container of water for your fish. Put your fish in it. Not a ton of water, but enough that it, you know, can swim around and, and be comfortable. Um, and then like the same amount of water you would ship that fish in, let's say. And then in another container, I put some water, also from an aquarium, so it's not, it doesn't have chlorine in it or something like that, or, you know, gassed off, stable water that a fish could go in. And I put my clove oil in there and mix it in really well. And then I would take a small amount of that and pour it in the container with the fish and wait a few minutes. And if you need more, I'd pour a little more and I'd wait a few minutes. And I'd pour a little more and I'd wait a few minutes until the fish has gradually got enough uh, exposure to clove oil that it kind of gradually drifts off. The reason I think that's the best way to do it is if you put a fish in water that has a sufficient amount of clove oil in it, the fish will experience distress. Early on, when I was first figuring this out, um, I put quite a bit of clove oil in the water thinking that would make it quicker for the fish and therefore less stressful for the fish. I put the fish in there and it was a traumatic experience for the fish. There was enough clove oil in that water that the fish reacted, <laughs> I'll just be honest, violently and did not have a good end. Okay, that was a huge mistake on my part. So that's when I realized, oh, this isn't something where you want to put a bunch of the um, agent in the water and then add the fish to it. And my thinking was wrong there. Instead of that being the best way, the most humane way to do it, it turned out to be horrible. So I do it that gradual way now. So the fish never experiences any trauma or um, distress from like a sudden exposure to clove oil. So that's how, that's how I prefer to do it. And, it, and it, it prevents from having to know precise measurements and stuff like that either. You're just, you know, gradually putting in a little bit and observing and eventually the tipping point will be reached. It's 825. I know that because Killers Reptiles and Aquatics has thrown down a super chat and a Pippi Longstocking Cheerleader super sticker. Usually when Bob does that this time of chat, he's calling my attention to the fact that we might want to do the giveaway and start wrapping things up. So with 389 participants, thanks for being here, folks. We're going to go ahead and do the giveaway for some Black Paradise fish, Macropoda specti. These beauties, I just think these things are awesome. Man, the wet spot took a good picture. Kudos to them. That is an excellent picture of that species. That is accurate. This is a nice, full-grown, wild-tail-type male. Uh, they look every bit that pretty. So... 
Good job to the folks at the wet spot. Um, there are 230 folks that have entered, and the winner is Otis. Otis Cauldron. Otis, congratulations. You have two minutes to chime in. I'm going to put on my timer here. Two minutes timer. You have two minutes to chime in. Let us know you're here. You do that just by uh, putting a comment in the chat. Uh, you do have to be present to win, and if you don't do that within the next two minutes, you will forfeit your winnings and will draw somebody else. Them's the rules. Barb Johnson, have you seen the Canadian weather? We are warm. Yeah, I mean, right now. <laughs> right now, yeah. But I don't want to, like, open up shipping to Canada and then, oh, next week it's cold. Okay, no longer shipping to Canada, and then open it and close it and open and close it. I just want to open it and be open, you know for the duration until until the next winter. And hopefully through next winter, if, if we can get your customs trained to the point that uh, so many fish aren't delayed, then then it can work better. Kaylin de Rosier, just came home to my 20 mystery fry swimming around the new community tank, the spotted Congo, Congo puffer now lives in. Don't puffers typically catch and eat small things like that? Yeah, unless they're super small. I mean, if fry are super small, then the puffer's not going to get them. But then they'll get big enough that he'll get interested in it. But another thing is, if the puffer tries for a while and fails to catch those fry, they'll stop bothering and they'll raise up with the puffer. I've had that happen. I, I had a colony of endlers once that uh, I didn't mean to raise with my spotted Congo puffers, but I... Like there was a female handler in there or a few fry or something and they grew up and then they had babies and they grew up and eventually had this, this uh, whole colony of Santa Maria handlers in with some Congo spotted puffers. So yeah, they do eat small things, but not always, not in every circumstance. Okay, it's time to go back to one and the timer's up. All right. Hey, Otis Coltrin is here. Otis, congratulations, you have won. Please send us your first name, your last name, your mailing address to hello at dancefish.com, H-E-L-L-O at dancefish.com, and we will schedule the shipment of your new um, Black Paradise fish to you. Okay, I think that it's time to close this down. Thanks to everyone for coming on this Wednesday. Appreciate you hanging out. Appreciate the moderators for being here and keeping the chat uh, in trim, like a fine sailing vessel. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who's a member of the channel and folks that gave memberships away. I really appreciate that. Also, folks that threw money at us in the form of super chats and super stickers and all that. Every bit counts and we appreciate it. If you were active in the chat, thanks for being here and making it lively. If you weren't active in the chat, I still love you. Hail the Lurker Nation. If you're watching the replay, hello from the past. And if you're listening to the podcast, well, hello to you listeners. That's it. We'll be back next week. Same bat time, same bat channel with some really cool fish to show you. Until then, have a good one. Bye-bye.